Good morning, my name is Sebastian Turbo. I am the executive director of the New Cities Foundation, a Canada-based international nonprofit where we are committed to shaping a better urban future. And it's my pleasure to be moderating this session this morning. The goal of the next 50 minutes will be for us to discuss how cities can be more livable and sustainable and to take a deep dive into how urban planning and urban design can be used for inclusive climate action. In fact, my three fellow panelists are three leaders who are witnessing the complex effects of climate change in their work every day. So please welcome Gioia Ghezzi, Chair of the Ferrovie della Stato Italiane, Natalie Paladicev, President of Ivanoe Cambridge, and Anjali Pandet, Head of Corporate Sustainability at BNP Paribas UK. Please welcome them on stage. So, this morning I'd like us to untangle and better understand the strong relation between cities, climate change, and inclusivity. And why building livable, sustainable, and inclusive cities must be at the heart of the thinking of the G7 leaders when they convene here in Canada in just a few weeks from now. I think this is a very timely conversation indeed, because we cannot be talking about climate action without talking about cities. And we cannot be talking about climate action in cities without talking about inclusivity. Just a few facts to set the stage. Today, half of the world's population lives in cities, and this is set to rise to 70% by 2050. Cities already produce 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And cities will be dramatically affected by climate change. For example, remember that 90% of the world's biggest cities live by water. Here, think Venice, Dhaka, The Hague, Singapore, New York, or even Toronto. On top of this, the problem is that climate change isn't fair. Indeed, it's the poorest, most vulnerable populations of our cities who are disproportionately at risk from climate change. And this is true in cities the world over, rich and poor. For example, two-thirds of the jobs that were lost after Hurricane Katrina were, lost, were, were jobs lost for women. On the brighter side, the good news is that cities and cities leaders are increasingly stepping up for climate. And they're increasingly complementing, if not acting in lieu of national governments. We, can, we, we saw this, of course, with the overwhelming support of many leading uh, mayors around the world, around the COP21 Paris Agreement, and even more so when 50 American cities announced that they were actually committing to the agreement when the federal government failed to do so. So, if there's agreement in principle that sustainable and inclusive cities are the way forward, if it's clear that cities are stepping up to the plate, we also know that cities cannot act alone and that indeed public-private partnerships, relationships, coordination will be central to solving our global urban challenges. And so this is where I turn to my panelists with the following questions. How do we bring these cities to life? How do we ensure that the way we work, we live, we play, and we move in cities is both sustainable and inclusive? Do you have examples of how urban design and urban planning can have an impact both on climate and inclusivity? And what solutions can we better leverage and invest in to move faster and to move better? Let me turn to you, Julia, first. And let's talk about mobility, this big topic today. You know, the whole transportation conversation has exploded recently with two big hot topics, autonomous vehicles and electrification. What effects do you think these two big trends will be having on climate action at the sea level? Thank you, Sebastian. Um, autonomous vehicles and uh, um, electric vehicles are a very important part of uh, the equation for a new mobility. Let's remember that transport contributes um, between uh, 18 and 30 percent, depending on where you measure, of uh, uh, emissions that create uh, climate 
change. So it's absolutely imperative that uh, uh, mobility and big mobility companies like uh, uh, Gruppo Ferrovie dello Stato, where I work, uh, do their part and uh, partner with uh, um, the public sector and the state, uh, states and the cities they work with for uh, um, a new sustainable way of transport. Now, per se, uh, both uh, autonomous vehicles and uh, electric vehicles are not an answer uh, to climate change. So um, if we have autonomous vehicles uh, uh, in the same numbers as uh, private cars, if the autonomous vehicles were not electric, uh, then uh, from the point of view of climate change, uh, there would be no difference. There would be may perhaps more convenience, um, perhaps uh, uh, fewer cars uh, on the road, uh, but definitely uh, not enough uh, as a solution. Equally, if you think of electric cars per se, they do not produce emis emissions, uh, but uh, how much they pollute uh, is simply due to what are the sources that produce the uh, electricity to run them. So you are at risk of simply moving pollution from within the city to uh, the next uh, 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 carbon uh, uh, producing uh, uh, base uh, outside, outside the city. So um, what we really need to think about is, one, how to reduce consumption. For example, um, that's an Italian example, but the last uh, uh, tender we did for trains, uh, which remain uh, the least polluting way of moving around, please always choose trains whenever you can. Um, trains uh, in these tenders were specified so that they would be 30% less polluting than their predecessors. So again, private companies have a very big role in shaping the market and moving it uh, to a more uh, sustainable environment. So uh, autonomous vehicles are going to be very important if we can really change the way we think about mobility. For example, on uh, uh, demand booking of shared uh, vehicles, minibuses that you can book and can come and pick you up wherever you are, um, rather uh, than at predefined uh, uh, stops. Um, that is going to uh, reduce traffic, and there are studies uh, uh, showing that. Electric vehicles are going to be very, very important to reduce pollution in cities, but behind those, we need to put pressure for uh, um, sustainable, renewable sources of uh, energy and for um, decreasing really substantially the amount of energy we all use. I'd like to follow up on what you were saying around this kind of coming debate around autonomous vehicles. You could, in the future, we could all have our own autonomous vehicle, or we could be using shared autonomous vehicles. Uh, according to you, which scenario would be, aside from the climate, the most inclusive in terms of uh, future transportation? It is obviously the latter, and actually you see already in some instances in certain uh, um, developing countries in the world that, that uh, uh, shared uh, uh, vehicles that are not autonomous are the way of uh, moving uh, people around, of allowing uh, cheap transportation. Mm -hmm. So we, we are moving in general from an, an economy of owning um, stuff in general, houses, cars, uh, uh, means of uh, transport to an economy of sharing more and more. So I'm definitely going for the latter and very much pushing for also a circular economy as a solution. Okay. And I think you can look at the uh, behaviors of the millennials. They are not interested at all in having their own uh, car. I have myself a 20-year-old uh, uh, boy, and I ask him, why don't you take your driving license? And he saying, okay, only 30% of my generation is going to own his own vehicle, and I'm not going to be a part of it. So I think it's, it's just the uh, a question of behaviors and aspirations of this generation, which is going to change dramatically the way we are using 
vehicles, the, the thing that we own things instead of just using it. So it's more a question of not having things, but using them, which is, uh, I think, happening now. Hopefully. Uh, well, actually, uh, Natalie, we're, you know, the expected growth of, of, of cities in, in the years to come is supposed to be huge still. It's not going to be slowing down, uh, once again, in the rich world and the developing world at, at, at large. Um, what role do you see even though Cambridge play in making sure this growth in our cities is once again both sustainable and inclusive? Um, within Ivano Cambridge, which is, uh, as you maybe know, the subsidiary, the real estate subsidiary of the Caisse des Dépôts et Placements du Québec, um, it's all about uh, responsibility, uh, footprint, sustainable. And I would say, because I don't want to um, show myself as too much philanthropic, so it's not only a question of showing the right example, it's also a question of a sustainable return on investment because we have a big responsibility. We are in charge of uh, the uh, uh, um, Quebecois retirees. Uh, so it's a long-term job. We are not here for the year or for the next 10 years. We are here forever. So we have to build something which is in line and consistent with this goal. So it means that as soon as we look at a project, we have to be sure that we are going to be proud of this legacy. So that's very important for us, and the way we are looking at uh, uh, the environment is, uh, and the cities where we are invested in is really, uh, first thing, the demographic play. So we try to find something which is, for these sustainable reasons, uh, going to be long-term. So where we think that the trend, the flows are going to be recurrent, regular, and are, are going to be uh, very, the thing that we are building something is going to be meaningful in the city where we do that. And, and also because once more we have to be, to be consistent with the two goals we are aiming at, uh, sustainable on one side, invest, return on investment on the other side. Um, I did my homework because I'm, I'm not sure that you are going just to believe me on what I, I'm just uh, telling. So I got back uh, to the 11th UN Sustainable Development Goal, uh, which is, as you probably know, sustainable cities and communities. And I just did the, the job to check that we were in line with it. So this way, it's not just my words and, and what I'm telling you today, but some real actual examples of what we do, uh, which are really consistent with that. So just a few things, because I'm, based on that, uh, we, we have been uh, able to really uh, realize that we could talk probably about an hour about uh, what Ivano Cambridge does in this area, but I'm, I'm sure I don't have this hour, so I'm just going to uh, use a few minutes just to illustrate that. So the first goal is reduce the environmental impact of cities. Um, just two things. First thing is that it's not only once more words, it's also commitments. And for Ivano Cambridge, we are committed uh, to uh, decrease the um, um, uh, greenhouse uh, carbons emissions by 2025 by 25%. So it's a real commitment. It's an actual one that you can check because it's on our, our website. Uh, we are also committed to increase the low carbon investment by 2020 by 50%. So you see, it's, it's just not a slight thing. It's really something which is going to significantly, significantly move the needle and once more show the sign that it's not a question only of philosophy, but it's a question of survival. Second example, really practical. We own uh, like um, a whole area of Manhattan. It's, uh, it's uh, housing. It's both affordable housing and I would say regular housing. And here we just um, uh, implemented just a few months ago something which is really uh, impressive. It's a rooftop solar project and it's the most uh, the largest private multifamily residential rooftop solar project in the US. So once more, I think it's a great example of what we are really doing and not only thinking about. And of course, I can't resist to think about um, one of the, of the other goals, which is provide sustainable transport system, because I'm just uh, close to you and inspired by what you said just a few minutes ago. And because also we have a wonderful project here in Toronto, which calls 
the CIBC Square, where uh, you probably know that there is an integration, a direct connection with public transport. So here, the job is not only to influence what we are going to do as a real estate developer, but also the fact that we are responsible that the way is going to be used by the people. You know, in real estate, we, we, we say a thing quite frequently, which is that we are moving from spaces to places and that's very important because here within this CIBC square uh, which is just a project which is just a few um, uh, meters away from here it's it's a wonderful place it's just the beginning of the of, of the projects and and the works uh, is going to be an example of what we can do so mixing connecting directly with the transports so this way we are going to influence also the impact on the transport so less carbon, so meaning less carbon on real estate, less carbon on the use of the real estate. The second thing is that we have integrated within the project a public park. So it's going to be really, not only, um, I would say, a building, it's going to be an all area reflecting the last lifestyle that we think the tenants are expecting from this building. So, of course, I couldn't resist to talk, resist to talk about it because it's just uh, close to us and I think it's a good illustration. Um, last thing, maybe, but not last, because it's very important for us. You know, we are traditionally uh, a Canadian fund. We own 25 shopping centers in Canada. That's really the history of Ivano Cambridge. It's where we started our job and we, we are operating those shopping centers. And we um, opened uh, more than one year ago a new shopping center in, in uh, British Columbia, which is called Towers and Mills. And this building uh, was completely integrated with the project with the Towers and First Nations. So it's also the way we are taking care in terms of inclusion of the way we are only, we are not once more uh, building one thing like an object without anything around, but really trying to integrate this building within the lifestyle, within the culture, within the environment. So I think that's very key in the way we're looking at real estate. And I, I hope that we're gonna be the, the soul to do that. But once more, because of this sustainable horizon, I'm sure that we're gonna have some uh, new friends thinking the same way on the short term. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Um, Anjali, in your, in your case, um, and in, in, in this context where cities are taking the lead in climate action, how is a bank like BNP Paribas uh, accompanying uh, these cities in financing projects that drive impactful, uh, inclusive climate change action? Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you for mentioning the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, because I think this is so key. It is the first time in history that we have a definition for what sustainability means. And so it's the first time that we're actually talking about all the different parameters of sustainability, inclusivity, climate action, water, animal welfare, but where it's not competing, where the purpose of the sustainable development goals is we're trying to figure out how to move all of those forward without them becoming competing factors. And so I think to be really honest, you know, our, our organization and most of the large organizations that are sort of helping to move the capital that's required for these projects, you know, we were looking at sustainability opportunistically. If it made financial sense, if a project came to us and it was interesting, then okay. But we were not necessarily strategically thinking about what we need to do in sustainability. So let me give you an example. You know, now we get projects, for example, about airports that are going to be extremely, like new airports that are going to bring a great opportunity to that city because it increases economic activity, you know, it, it increases mobility, um, globalization, etc. Um, but then, you know, the question mark then is that, but then are, by adding this extra large airport, are we increasing um, carbon emissions from air travel? And so then we say to ourselves, okay, so everything has to be partnered with also then how are we investing in biofuel technology? Are we, so we have a fund, for example, that looks at specifically investing in some of these interesting gap technologies, smart grids, biofuels, and you know, these types of solutions which are going to help us keep powering cities and keep growing because that is the direction that cities are going. Um, 
when we look at some of the more interesting projects that we've done, of course, you know, being a French bank, BNP Paribas, you know, we've partnered quite a bit with the city of Paris, and we have different areas, different banlieues, which are the areas outside of Paris, which are historically sort of low income, um, and we've sort of taken on big projects, and to win these projects, we have to prove to the city of Paris and to the municipalities that we are thinking about agile working, that we're thinking about inclusivity, and that we have to prove we're thinking about sustainability. So there's one such project, for example, where we are making a huge amount of the construction out of a sustainable source wood instead of cement, which reduces the carbon footprint of moving those logistics. It also creates a much more environmental atmosphere, and most of it is going to be vertical gardens. Because when we think about cities, we really have to think sort of user-centric. What do people need in cities? Water, food. Mobility, you know, if I can go to mobility, you know, Shell put out a scenario this year um, in their analysis saying that, you know, we live in a world today which is 20% run on um, electricity and 80% run on fuel. Now, almost every type of fuel is putting carbon dioxide into that air. So when I turn the gas on in my house to cook my food, when I drive my car, the trains, et cetera, all running on diesel, you know, that's, we need to move to a world which is 80% run on electricity and 20% run on trains. Our trains run on electricity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and that's what's the most amazing thing about cities, is that there are cities across the world that are saying, we're not going to wait for all the government infrastructure to come. Our city is going to run on electric, um, electric trains. You know, we're going to change by 2030, 2050. And, and what we see now, what I see as our organization and, and how we work with our investors and how we work with our clients, is for the first time, people are thinking quite strate strategically and saying, how do I want to contribute to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? How do I want to contribute to climate action? And going aggressively and saying, we want to help electrify cities. We want to be part of expanding public transport systems. And those are the projects that we're looking for. And, and I, I, I can't resist to add something because we, we are partners on one development in Paris where we implemented for the first time a green loan on a building. So the, the project called Duo is in the south of Paris. It's comparable to what we do with CIBC and with BNP Paribas. We have been able to um, really design the first green loan and we have an agency which has redesigned the criteria that we have to match to really being able to do that. So um, I think the illustration of this panel is exactly what we are aiming at. Each of us does not have the whole solution, but the combination of the three talents, which are on this <laughs> sofa, <laughs> I hope, and, and behind the organizations, uh, I hope could, could find some solutions. And, and being creative, I think, it's, it, it is going to be key. So even if we have some expertise and some skills, we can combine things, and I think that th this green uh, loan is an example of what we can do to really try to, to move forward together. If I can turn I, just for a second, just elaborate on green loans, because that, this is where you can see that the dial is changing. We have um, corporate clients and companies that come to us and say, we want you to lend to us, but we don't want just our financial performance to be taken into account when you're doing the loan pricing. We want you to measure us on our the sustainability performance. And that is what I think is fascinating because when you start looking at every development project like that, you change the way that capital is going to move to solve these problems. I think capital is a very important uh, um, push factor here, but I do have a slightly different view. Um, as, as you can see, for example, all of our companies uh, uh, subscribe uh, uh, to the Global Compact. We all, in our way, uh, try to do something uh, to combat climate change. However, I think that the sum of all we do is insufficient. I think, uh, unfortunately, that the sum of little actions is uh, very important, but achieves too little. And uh, we really need much more drastic um, action here and an ex exponential acceleration of pace in both abating our um, greenhouse emissions 
and uh, uh, capturing them because uh, what is never talked about is that even if we went to a zero uh, carbon world by uh, 2050, we would still have to capture uh, tons and tons of CO2 to avoid uh, um, the temperature of the world going beyond uh, the, the increase of two degrees. Um, since uh, uh, we started measuring the temperature of the world in 1850, the four um, hottest years were um, 2014, 15, 16, 17. And uh, in terms, uh, and the, our emissions globally are going up and up and up. If you look at, um, uh, you know, ice analysis in Antarctica for uh, millions of years, uh, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere was uh, around uh, um, uh, between 200, 300 mi milligrams um, part. Uh, uh, um, uh, per volume, and now uh, that amount has increased beyond 400, and since the Paris Agreement, we've increased again to 406 uh, uh, milligrams per part, which uh, is very, very close uh, uh, to the threshold, which will take us to the point of no return. So um, we really need to become much, much more radical, every single company, not only uh, the big companies that we represent, but every single small company, every individual, every building, every city, every mayor, going back to what you were saying, Sebastian, and mayors are doing potentially more than nations uh, at this point in time, uh, needs to really plan ahead for a dramatic change in the way we live and our behaviors. I, I, I was indeed going to ask the three of you if you, if you thought, if you believe that, both from your, uh, from your organ organizational perspective but also, also as residents of cities, if you thought things were moving fast enough in terms of climate change. Joey, I think you've just answered that question. Uh, Natalie, Anjali, if you want to, to respond to that. I really think that um, you know, when, when I'm thinking about real estate, I'm thinking about uh, urbanization. So I think that it's, it's a question of, uh, of urban planning. And, uh, um, and that's why the mayor are so key. And we talked about, uh, about it just after, before the panel, because we, we really think that here there is um, something major that could change dramatically the way we are looking uh, forward. Uh, that's difficult because capital could be a chance, but sometimes it's a trap too, uh, because the pressure of the capital, short-term capital especially, could lead to, uh, to bad decisions. So uh, it's where um, I think that we have now new mayor just elected, and we, we are talking about the, uh, uh, the new uh, women uh, elected uh, in, in major cities. Uh, I left Paris when Adi Anne Hidalgo was just elected, and I joined Montreal when uh, Valérie Plante uh, was just elected. So I, I, see, I see like a sign. I'm, I'm quite happy to, uh, uh, to, to really be the witness of the, those potential changes. I think that Anne Hidalgo uh, has, has proven over the last uh, month that she wanted something different. It seems that Valérie Plante uh, is showing also some signs that she, she wants to uh, to, to tra transform Mon Montreal as an example in what we could do. As a, an a European, I, I really see major differences from Europe and, and North America in terms of uh, behavior and what you, you told you. You know, we used to have in, in, in France in the 70s when we had this uh, big oil uh, crisis that there was no small um, thing to do when we were 60, pe 60, pe 60 million people to achieve them. And I think that's, that's very true. And, and it's not something that I see in North America where oil is everywhere and energy is not a problem. So it has not led people to, uh, I would say, very strict or drastic uh, behavior. So uh, I hope that uh, uh, mayor, mayors could definitely have a, a, um, um, a great influence in the way they are going to, uh, to develop and design their city. Because think about something very clear. It's what we talked about just a few minutes ago. But if you think about building an area with everything, the parks, the schools, the sport equipments, 
um, everything will be in the same area, you're sure that people are going to use less where they higgle, so it's going to be efficient at a point. So, but if you look around and at the different cities around the world, I, I'm always uh, struck by that when I, when I travel, is that somewhere, there are many places when you don't even see the, the, I would say, the rule of a philosophy of the constructions. It's just one area, then something different, and there is not a real link or harmony, and it's not a question of, uh, of being comfortable, it's, going to, it's a question now of being efficient. So it's something which is going to matter a lot, but it, it, it's, um, it's difficult because sometimes you have already uh, constructions and you can't just uh, get rid of them uh, without uh, impact and especially money. Uh, but I think it could be the, the big responsibility of the, uh, the major actors uh, in the short term. Thank you. Uh, Anjali, do you want to, to respond on the question of are we moving fast enough? No. <laughs> no, you don't want to respond or we're not moving fast enough? <laughs> pretty much on track to completely fail at reaching the COP21 <laughs> agreement globally. It's, it, what we are doing, I've been working on climate change since 2006, and I'm very, very proud of what we are doing, and that there is concrete action, that targets are real, that we're hiring talent, we're upskilling people, we're innovating. I, you know, even at BNP Paribas, you know, although our green bond um, desk is still small relative to our bond desk, it's what we've grown is exponential in the last few years, you know? And so, yes, we're doing a lot, but there is so much more to do. And I have too many conversations with people who either don't believe in climate change, are more focused on finance, and they're constantly saying, it has to make money, it has to make money. And you know, we have really, really senior people inside BNP Paribas who are saying, well, does it? If it creates serious social and environmental value, and if it's financially at least sustainable, does it have to make lots of money? Or can we find a way to calculate that natural value, that, that environmental and social value, and really put tangible, you know, importance to that and and that's senior 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 bankers who are asking that question who for decades have been talking about making money instead so I, I think we're going in the right direction but no we're not doing enough cities are not doing enough it's there's so much there's such a huge gap okay but I think yeah. we, we have to be careful because if we say too much that there is almost nothing done for the time being and so much to do for some people is just the reason why they do nothing because they say okay it's not going to change so much because there are so many things to, to do around and i'm just a small part of it I, I don't think so i think we have to be responsible and to say okay i'm influencing things so even if it doesn't move uh, fast enough nevertheless to show that something is happening According to me, you know, success appeals success. So if you are able to demonstrate that things are working, that we're going to have more successes. And, but if we, if we say only, okay, it's too, too difficult, we are not going to make it, then we are just going to say, okay, we give up. And, and, uh, and I see that quite often. I, I don't know if you see this kind of behavior, but in, in my environment, when I talk about those things, so often people say, okay, you see, we, we see all those things on the newspapers, on TV all the time, but we can't really do anything. No, yes, we can do something. I think we have to, to that's probably my yeah, mind. Hero, the good we stories. To, yes, we have to, yeah. exactly. We have to have good examples. Okay, just to come back to the point you were trying to hint to, Natalie, now I'll start with you, Joya, on uh, um, the rise of female mayors in cities like Paris, the, like Montreal, Madrid, Barcelona. Uh, as Chiara Corazza, the managing director of the Women's Forum, was reminding us yesterday, of the 300 bigger cities in the world, only 25 of them are today run by, by women. Um, do you think, and I guess you would, that there's a case for stronger female leadership in cities, whether at the mayor level or even down the, in, the, in the administration? Joya. Well, absolutely, like everywhere, there is a case for more uh, women mayors and particularly for more women involved in urban uh, planning. Uh, data, I think, is going to be uh, fundamental. I think uh, uh, women are already and need to take on uh, the battle of uh, uh, climate change. 
uh, there is uh, uh, plenty to do and uh, uh, we need uh, to squash uh, the voices uh, that say, oh, it's too late, let's do nothing. There is plenty to do. We are doing a lot. We continue to do a lot. So role modeling is uh, very, very important about, uh, you know, from people and from companies. I think we need also to enforce, to include uh, um, the external costs of what you do in, in the pricing. Um, there will be more and more uh, pressure from uh, customers, particularly uh, the young uh, generations like uh, Natalie's uh, son. There is uh, uh, pressure so from, from customers, from uh, uh, regulation, and uh, uh, from uh, funds and investments. So there are, there are uh, um, ethical, there are green funds, green bonds. Um, there are now uh, gender equality uh, funds and, and bonds in which we should all uh, try uh, to invest. So the demand of investors uh, for better practices will also uh, may, uh, you know, achieve a lot of change, I think. Uh, Natalie, on the case for female leadership uh, in cities. Um, I hope I represent a very modern company because I, I'm, I was just appointed president of Ivano Cambridge just a few weeks ago and I'm French, so I work for a Canadian pension fund uh, which has been able to appoint a, a foreign woman, so I really think that we are a good example of what we can, we can do. Uh, I definitely uh, believe in, in, uh, in female leadership because it's just a part of the diversification. There was a, uh, a minister in France uh, we used to say uh, it's not a minority, we are representing 50% of the, of the world. So uh, definitely it's just a question of not having always the same people around the table, but mixing ideas. So for me it's not a qu question of being feminist, it's a question of just integrating some new ideas, probably sometimes uh, different points of view, more pragmatic. You know, thinking about urban planning, when you are a mother, you think yourself about, okay, uh, if I spend less time to, uh, to drive my, my children to the school, it's going to be a great advantage for me. And I'm sure it's going to help my career because, you know, I, I heard something this morning, it's, it's funny, on, on, the, on the French radio, talking about the fact that if the uh, um, public transportation were safer, then it could help the female carriers because for the time being, people, especially in Europe, we know that, um, they are not uh, able to take the metro after uh, 8 o'clock 8 o'clock in the evening because it's not safe. So they have to leave earlier their office and it, it's, it, it prevents uh, them from having like the same career uh, as a male. So it's this kind of thing which is really pragmatic that we could think of. So, um, you know, I, I, I come from France where we implemented the quotas regarding the boards. I was not in favor of that at the beginning, but at the end, I really think that it was the only reason why we changed our uh, behavior. So I think that regarding what we talk about today, we would have to think about quotas too. And, and maybe, cities. yes, maybe more incentives than just uh, discounts, but trying to find something which would lead people to be more creative if, even if they don't, don't want to. So um, I, I'm, I'm just like a dictator, but, <laughs> but I think that at a point it's the only way to move people um, as a whole, like the whole room, everybody will be concerned by it. So, uh, so I think that it, it, it's the same for female representation and female leadership. If we don't do something which is like um, mandatory, that I'm not sure that it, it would move uh, uh, fast enough. Okay. Uh, you know, last year we had um, we had a big conference uh, at BNP Paribas called the Sustainable Future Forum. It happens in the fall. And I was in charge of the content, and so I was speaking to all of my um, uh, my coverage team, um, and we were talking about who from their client base, investors, and corporates could come and speak about sustainability. And we didn't even try. And by the end of it, when we looked at the list and who was coming, we realized that we had some 76% female on the dais. I have been to quite a few banking conferences, some also from BNP Paribas, and we have less than 3% women who are sitting on the panels. And so we were questioning, why is it that there's so many women who are such strong experts in this? And even in BNP Paribas, a lot of the people who are working on sustainability actually are women. When I, you, it, I don't think it was chosen, it wasn't on purpose, it just sort of happened. And 
And I, in my role, I get approached all the time by people in the bank who are wanting to stay in the banking industry, looking for that purpose plus profession, you know, as like sort of the new world that we all live in where everybody wants that purpose. And I can't tell you that I think probably there's a really high proportion of, of women who are coming to me. And so, I, listen, I'm the last person to stereotype and gender bias and, you know, there's lots of things about me that wouldn't fit into the female stereotype either. But I think there is something about long-term planning and the idea that sustainability is all about inclusivity and is about a lot more things than just one angle of performance, but all different versions of performance that I think might be attracting certain characteristics in women. And, and so when we think about who needs to be in charge of cities, et cetera, you know, obviously the more that I think that we can have people who think about long-term planning and who are, you know, committed to the long-term over the short-term, those are the people I think that need to be there. And, and what we're seeing in, in, the, in the private sector is that they tend to be a lot of women who are interested in those roles. If, if, if I may express a personal opinion, you know, spending my days looking at cities, it's really struck me how historically most, if not all of our cities have been designed by men. Uh, and we still haven't had this opportunity to see what cities designed by women could look like. And I'm personally really looking forward to it. Uh, <laughs> we have about 10 minutes left. We did want, with my fellow panelists, to open the floor to questions. I think there's three microphones in the, in the audience. Uh, if you'd like to share a comment, a quick comment, a quick question to to the panel, I have a question here. I don't know if the panels are, the microphones are circulating. I think they're coming over there, yes. Uh, here, yes. Any other questions just so I know where you are? Let me take a, okay, one over here after and one over there. Okay, we'll take a. Hi there, my name is Shauna Levy. I'm president of Design Exchange. Could Canada's you speak closer? Yeah, thank you. Hi, <laughs> I'm Shauna Levy. I'm president of Design Exchange. We're Canada's design museum. Last fall, we did a big expo in partnership with the UNDP all around how design can help to achieve the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, I was absolutely amazed at how few companies in Canada are actually engaged in the SDGs in any meaningful way. And I'm just wondering, this is geared to Natalie or to the other panelists, how do we get Canadian companies to take the SDGs seriously and uh, implement them in a holistic, authentic way so that the public can be engaged as well? If you don't mind, I'll take the three questions at the same time. So there's a, another question over here. Yes, you have a mic and over there. Okay, yeah. so please. So hi, um, Nadia Petrolito from L'Oreal. It's more of a comment slash question. Um, I can't resist, but to um, challenge a little bit this notion that women are the only ones or at least are proponents of just this climate change. I think that if we're going for this drastic change that you're talking about, I think we need to bring obviously the men along with us and if anything, I think if we're going to try to battle both of them together by putting us in these positions plus trying to do the climate change, I think we're setting ourselves up for failure. So. How can we then, therefore, because I, I think that you're underestimating the influence that I think women might have. So how would you think that right now in the positions that we do occupy, can we influence the men that are in the positions and then eventually, of course, take on the bigger roles? Okay, and the third question over here. Do you have a microphone? Uh, yeah, so uh -huh. my question is a little unrelated to the previous questions, um, but it's more on the role of urban planning and smart cities in addressing urban poverty, which can be such a gendered issue and obviously has such strong environmental impacts. So I was just wondering in your respective roles what you think um, the future of urban planning will look like in addressing poverty in cities. Okay, so a question on urban planning and poverty, on the role of men and SDGs and Canadian companies. If you want to... Um, maybe re regarding the, the, the male and the influence of, of women uh, I, I think the, the best way to be pragmatic once more is the more uh, women leaders we're going to have, the more influence we, we're going to be able to really project on, on, on the companies and on the uh, society as a whole, on the nations. So uh, that's why I, I really think that it, it comes, it's, it's really a bottom-up thing. So it, it has to be everywhere to be at the top at a point. So it's, uh, 
it, my, my view is really to, 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 to look at that very pragmatically. And, and when you look at an, an organization, when you, are, you have the responsibility and the chance to be in charge, is really to prepare the future. So it's really a question of seeding for not only tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow and so on. And, and we are really looking at the different layers on an organization to be sure that we have people for tomorrow, but also for the day after tomorrow. And, and if we are able to do that, and that's why, you know, the, the, this female things for me is just um, an item of the inclusion thing. We have to think about the way we are going to become more consistent as an organization to face the new challenges. So it's all about sustainability. So, so that's why, but, but you know, the, the most difficult thing, and I, I can tell you, is really to resist to do something which is going to matter just now, but be forgiven or um, forgotten the day after. We have to think long, both long-term and short-term. That's the most difficult thing. So my, I think my recipe would be just to keep the eyes on the horizon, but to try to find some quick wins to attract people, to, to be able to, to, to have more eyes on the horizon. Uh, Anjali, you, you might not be specifically familiar with the Canadian context, but what, how would you try to convince more Canadian companies to commit to the SDGs? What would be your call to action? Or just companies in general. I mean, oh, companies I think, in general, yeah, in this I case, a, according to question. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what we did at BNP Paribas, if that helps. Um, well, first, and I think we were one of the first to sort of do this. So we've mapped our entire business against the SDGs. We've published that online. Um, we organize a massive forum every year to discuss what are the sustainable development goals. And we asked the question to the audience. Um, we had sort of one of those apps where you could answer. And we asked how many of you are mapping your business to the sustainable development goals, and the number was really low. And that's when we realized that we need to help with the education part because people don't realize even how to do that. Like, how do you even begin that process? And there's enough reporting and everything that everyone's already kind of bombarded with. So to get our coverage teams really energized and ready to go out and talk to their clients, we ran a massive sustainable development goal campaign in the bank. Because we at the end of the day, if you don't understand it as an individual, how are you ever going to explain it to your child, let alone to your, to your client? And oftentimes you're learning it from your child because they're learning it in school, right? And so we did this campaign called What's My Impact? And it was sort of, you know, this whole idea of like, you know, I mean, come on, the sustainable development goals are like zero poverty, like no hunger. And I know some of you are like hungry right now, you know, and how are we even going to get to those places by 2030? And we talked about, don't be afraid of how overwhelming this is. Be energized by how every step you make as an individual goes towards it. So something as simple, which, you know, as we got rid of all of the paper cups in the building, one day the entire um, bank, you know, and you can imagine like 5,000 traders arrived to office and there were no paper cups. And there was a sign saying that, you know, from now on we're going to reduce our carbon footprint and, and go pick up your free reusable cup and can you use that? And the reason, okay, like if I look at BNP Paribas, you know, maybe my flight here is like equivalent to how much the carbon footprint of the cups are for that day. It's, it's not the most significant thing in our carbon footprint, but what we did is we forced everybody in the bank to actually change their entire habit so they could no longer go to the cafeteria pick up their coffee come up to their desk they had to go to their desk get their cup wash it we installed kitchens and we found out across the street the starbucks told us that people are coming there with their reusable cup and they're crossing and so i'm pretty sure people weren't going before with a mug and we wanted to force them to change their lifestyle and everywhere all over the bank we plastered sdg 12 responsible consumption and production and we're like, you are helping us achieve SDG 12. And then when we said to them, okay, are you ready to talk now about SDG 12 to your clients? Something felt natural. Something started to make sense. So I think there needs to be a kind of ground up approach where you know, all, you know, and then many of you guys might work for organizations that have important consumer brands. And I think the sustainable development goals needs to start coming into our advertising and the way that we talk to consumers as well, because we all have a responsibility to educate on what is actually a very complex 
subject and tried to break it down. And the beautiful thing about the Sustainable Development Goals is they're gorgeous. They're so colorful and they look so enticing and it's a great market. It is a great branding campaign and it's meant to be user friendly. You know, it's, it's meant, and if I can give one small point about the mail thing, I think you're, listen, like the client, when it rains, and when it snows where it's not supposed to snow, that falls on men, women, children, like, <laughs> I, you know. So first and, f yeah, <laughs> first and foremost, like we are, there is complete equality in, in my opinion in how climate change affects us. Like I don't think it, I think there is, there is an argument that it adversely affects poor people more. Um, I think that when we look at the current scenario in climate change, in terms of the weather changes, it's affecting a lot of developing countries more who don't have the infrastructure to manage adaptation. Um, and I think that is an extreme collective responsibility. So I, I do believe that there is a role for, to discuss gender and climate change, but the reality is like, we need everybody to be talking about climate change in Thank the same way. And just quickly, as we have very little time left, maybe Joya, on, the, on the, the question of smart cities and underprivileged populations. I know you're currently working on a smart city project around Milan, if I'm correct. How, do you, how, how are you taking that factor in, into account? I, I think smart cities are uh, a great answer to both uh, uh, climate change, because uh, uh, urbanization is a gigantic trend uh, uh, in, uh, in the world, and cities are uh, the centers of pollution in the world, and also to poverty, because uh, uh, smart cities, which are cities well planned, answering to the needs of uh, uh, people and companies that need to work uh, in them in order to be safer, which is an important aspect of a smart city, need to be more uh, inclusive. In order to be sustainable, they need to be based on circular economy. And uh, um, through inclusivity and a more circular and sharing economy, you will also help to bridge the divide between uh, uh, the have and the have not. So, um, you know, we do not have time here to go into the detail of how that works, uh, but there are examples and there are hundreds of cities under uh, uh, the leadership of great mayors in uh, the world that are moving in this direction and I think we'll see very exciting uh, things there. Allow me just yep. one word on getting more companies to subscribe to the Sustainable Development Goals. I think, again, role modeling is very, very important. Uh, uh, we just got a great example of how you can do it uh, 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 within a company and move the company to adopt the goals, but also do not underestimate the peer pressure between companies, you know. If I'm a bank and see that BNP Paribas has uh, adopted the SDGs, uh, I might want to do the same. So the more of us do it and publicize it, uh, the more we'll adopt it. And uh, um, I think the issue of men and women has been uh, wonderfully addressed, so I will not add uh, uh, anything on that. A last comment, Natalie? Or Okay, uh, the red light is blinking. It's time for us to close this panel. Uh, I think it was a very interesting uh, conversation. Please, could we thank my fellow panelists? And uh, it's done.